Welcome back to the Word on Fire Institute lecture series, The Idolatry of Identity, Progressive Wokist Ideology, and the Catholic Response. In the previous lecture, I argued that progressivism appropriates and distorts fundamental elements of classical liberalism and libertarianism, particularly their claim that the definition of what is ultimately real, including what is morally real, is not embedded in objective reality, but rather is the product of individual will. Progressivism merely mutates individual will into group will and thereby endows identity groups with the power to define their own conception of the good and, indeed, of morality itself. The, uh, the ideological family that constitutes progressivism, however, is a mixed family, indeed so mixed, so inclusive, that it has roots not only in classical liberalism and libertarianism, but also in their ideological enemy, utilitarianism. That will be the focus of this lecture, the relationship between utilitarianism and progressivism. Now, there are two features of utilitarianism that progressivism appropriates. One, a consequentialist emphasis on securing the good of the group, even if it must sacrifice individual group members to do so. And two, a conceptualization of virtue that takes the form of public demonstrations of morality intended to communicate that group members and allies are the right kind of people with the right kind of feelings, a performance commonly called virtue signaling. To understand these utilitarian elements within progressivism, it is important first to, to dig a little deeper into how progressives define the meaning of community. In order to define a community as a community, a progressivism typically appeals to some observable and shared characteristic that also has cultural and, and political potency. The most dominant examples are race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation, uh, assuming members of the last category share their interior attractions publicly. Yet there is an important caveat to this. These categories and the criteria for membership are not definitionally fixed and do not include all possible permutations of sub-identities within each category. For example, as noted in the previous lecture, sexual orientation can mean different things according to different subgroups within the LGBTQIA community. For instance, when a person who identifies as trans also claims to be sexually oriented to those of his or her same biological sex. The, uh, the plus in the community's name also serves as a titular admission to the fact that there are no limits to possible identities that could fit within the community. Though in an Orwellian, some identities are more equal than others move, note that only a few identities get to have their own designated letter. The community, in short, can, can constantly redefine itself. This definitional mutability and instability is a product of progressivism's socialized autonomy previously discussed. The important takeaway for our purposes is to remember that progressive definitions of community do not come from any rationally objective standard, but rather from the will, the will of the identity group itself. However progressivism settles the definitional question of communal identity, it is crucial to highlight that it tends not to view all members within a community as deserving of equal moral regard. Rather, and this is where progressivism first draws on utilitarianism, its operating principle is to seek the greatest good for the greatest number of the identity group, which can, if necessary, exclude the good of individuals from within the same group. Perhaps the most conspicuous example of this utilitarian dimension of progressivism appears in American racial politics. In a recent recall election in the state of California, for example, black attorney, author, political pundit, and widely listened to radio talk show host Larry Elder challenged the white governor of California, Gavin Newsom, who, in addition to serving as governor, owns a winery in the Tony Napa Valley. 
Larry Elder grew up in a poor neighborhood. Gavin Newsom did not. Larry Elder experienced overt, overt racial discrimination during his life, including during his campaign. A white woman in a gorilla mask threw an egg at Elder while he was walking in public. Gavin Newsom did not. Gavin Newsom had the support of most of the white business elite in California and throughout the United States. Larry Elder did not. Now, using progressive logic, this matchup should have been a no-brainer. A marginalized black man from South Central Los Angeles versus a privileged white man from an elite fourth-generation San Francisco family? Could the right way for progressives to vote in this election be any clearer? Something interesting happened on the way to the ballot box, however. Progressives not only attack Larry Elder on ideological grounds, which of course is fair game, they attacked him on racial grounds. For example, a a black female columnist for the Los Angeles Times wrote a piece entitled, Larry Elder is the Black Face of White Supremacy. Now, consider the meaning of this title. It is directly implying that Elder is either a bad person because he supports white supremacy, though he is an African-American man, or that he is so dumb and incapable of formulating his own point of view that he can be manipulated to embrace positions that go directly against his self-interest as a black man. In other words, the article is implying that Larry Elder is either a self-hating villain or a moron not a competent individual who, weighing different political ideologies, has reached his own reason conclusion. Now, this article did not appear as some anonymous blog in the hinterlands of the internet. It was in the Los Angeles Times. The widely read website Politico also ran a piece written by another black woman arguing that Larry Elder was harming black people. You see, This tendency to attack members of racial groups that do not tow the progressive ideological line has certainly not been limited to Elder. Other nationally recognized African Americans who have also been criticized for their views on race include intellectual and author Thomas Sowell, political commentator Candace Owens, sports and culture journalist Jason Whitlock, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and politicians Winsome Sears, Alan Keyes, Herman Cain, and Ben Carson, among many, many others. What unites these and many other examples is that progressive racial politics includes these individuals as belonging to the black community only until they say or do something with which the community disagrees, at which point they are jettisoned in the name of the community. This willingness to sacrifice members of the group is typical of the utilitarian calculation of aggregate well-being. All progressivism does is remove aggregate from society as a whole and apply it to the group as a whole, and voila, you get an unquestionably highly accomplished black man being demeaned as a white supremacist because he challenges progressive racial politics and thereby threatens the identity group's political goals. Progressivism has utilitarianism to thank for this cutthroat approach to protecting the community's interests. The second feature of utilitarianism detectable in progressivism is the construal of morality in terms of a a feelings-based virtue. Unlike classical liberalism and libertarianism, which typically locate their foundational principles in the operations of of human reason as it relates to autonomous decision-making, utilitarianism emerges from empiricist epistemologies, which means it derives all its moral principles from what can be observed in the physical world. And according to the classic empiricist utilitarian David Hume, the only morally relevant physically observable principle that guides human conduct is what Hume calls universal benevolence. Universal benevolence is a a positive feeling, and that's the key word to emphasize here, feeling, that he claims all humans have for their fellow human beings' well-being. This benevolent feeling, in turn, establishes the standard, the sole standard, by which we are to make moral judgments as individuals 
and societies. Those actions which have the consequence of producing the greatest feelings of benevolence for the greatest number of people are, for Hume, what makes you virtuous in the eyes of others. Virtue, in other words, it's surely a product of human feeling, which means only those who have the right kinds of feelings for others and crucially publicly display that they have the right kinds of feelings for others can earn the title of being a good person in society. Progressivism adopts this basic insight about the origins of morality, that it is located in publicly displayed feeling, not individual rationality. However, whereas utilitarian David Hume identifies universal benevolence as the feeling that defines morality and consequently the supreme human virtue, progressivism in its, in its signature appropriate and mutate style embraces the feeling of particularistic benevolence. Likewise, whereas Hume defines virtue as performing actions that serve the good of humanity, progressive politics defines virtue as performing actions that serve the good of a particular group. To be good thus means demonstrating to yourself and others that you have the right kinds of feelings for the right kinds of groups. This public display, indeed performance, of sentimental morality lies at the heart of virtue signaling. To virtue signal is to make a public display of solidarity with an identity group by, for example, uh, putting a black square on your Instagram profile, or wearing a knitted pink cap, serving LGBTQIA plus positive rainbow Oreo cookies at your children's party, or putting a, a protective talisman-like sign in your front yard advertising your household's progressive values. Making these public displays demonstrates that you are either a member of or an ally to a politically favored identity group, and as such, you are, you are one of the good people. Now, this may sound far from Hume's insistence that morality entails virtue and virtue entails benevolence, but progressivism agrees with Hume and utilitarianism more broadly that the foundation to morality and politics lies, lies not in the head, but in the heart. And as a bonus to its political aims, progressivism can consequently accuse its critics not only of having the wrong ideas, but rather of having a bad heart, that is, having the wrong kinds of feelings, or even better yet, being full of hate. In the next lecture, I'll turn to another key component of progressivism, wokeism's ideological makeup, postmodernism. Indeed, it is postmodernism we will see that supplies progressivism with perhaps its most potent political and cultural weapon yet. The power to claim that its definition of the truth, and note the exaggerated square quotes on truth here, cannot and should not ever be challenged. See you again soon. <laughs>